Good morning. My name is Nathaniel Osgood from the University of Saskatchewan Computational Epidemiology Public Health Informatics Lab. This talk is by, by request a tutorial on a technique that we've applied within our lab to over a dozen studies to great success, with many of those studies focused on the application of outbreak detection and prediction. Specifically, I'm going to be discussing the application of sequential Monte Carlo methods in the form of particle filtering with dynamic models, with a particular focus on mathematical epidemiology models. Now, this talk is aimed squarely at mathematical epidemi epidemiologists. However, reflecting the fact that the audience includes those from a wide variety of backgrounds, I want to be sure that everyone goes away with with some understanding from this talk. I'm therefore going to begin with a set of motivations and metaphors that I hope will ground and anchor intuition in the value that these methods bring to the table in a little bit of, of how they do so. Then reflect on the fact that some in the audience are probably more interested in implementing uh, these methods and in understanding the details of what they are mathematically. I'm going to provide, be characterizing the particle filtering algorithm in a nutshell, cutting to the chase about how it can be implemented. However, for many of the mathematicians in the audience, you'll be interested in, in something more substantial and understanding why these techniques work and what theory they're based. And to address this, I'm going to be going into some understanding of, of what particle filtering is from a mathematical perspective and, and focusing on the, the distribution from which it's, it, it samples. And then, as time allows, going into how it uses the, the theory of sequential importance sampling to perform this sort of sampling. In the closing minutes of the talk, I'll be talking about the need to balance model stochastics, to give our models uh, humility um, and allow them to characterize stochastic processes while still keeping them confident to, to give appropriate uh, predictions and talk about the application of particle filtering with agent-based models, which remains a big point of a priority and focus for our group. So the exemplar context um, uh, here lies in the area of uh, outbreak prediction response to infectious diseases in general and by extension to, to foodborne illness. Um, as those in the room will be familiar, many concerns around mobilization of, 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 of health resources in a timely fashion hinge on timely anticipation of outbreak evolution and detection of outbreaks. And uh, as a result, we're often interested in understanding where we're currently at and what's likely to, to play out in, in uh, coming days or weeks. Now, regular reporting gives us some indication of this, but can't by itself tell us what lies forward. For that, we typically turn to, to models. And our focus here um, is particularly in the context of situations which are marked by notable stochastics, uh, which is very common in this area, including the timing of outbreaks, consider a foodborne illness outbreak, for example, um, which can pop up at almost any time, and the evolution of those outbreaks are often, uh, often notably stochastic. Now, with traditional modeling projects, um, one has typically built the model uh, through a set of stages, and then one subsequently uses it for insight. Um, and uh, whilst that model may be updated um, for a new uh, starting point, characterizing a, a new starting situation, uh, at a later point or taking into account data that's emerged since the original formulation, often that's a fairly heavyweight manual process that can involve reparameterization, recalibration with the model, etc. Now, 
this poses a number of challenges with the outbreak response context. Um, one of the biggest ones being that, that unassisted, even the most detailed, even the most precisely characterized models will eventually diverge from the empirical situation as, as time passes. We, we characterize some initial state and we project forward for the next, uh, for coming days, next week or two. And as that time plays out, there'll be a, you know, typically a increasing gap between what the model anticipated and what the empirical data suggests. And that, that, that gap will typically increase over time. One of the biggest reasons for this is the presence of stochastics in the world, which even the best and most grounded model are not going to be able to anticipate. But as we all know, there's a wide variety of other factors, including approximations, omitted factors, new exogenous influences that can also um, play a role. Now, within the context of, of outbreak response for emerging infections, often uh, we're particularly challenged to, to build a model quickly enough to be policy relevant, whilst at the same time having a model that's that can really be highly accurate in, in predicting the uh, the outbreak evolution. Often there's there's limited time to build a very empirically grounded model. So the vision I'm presenting to you today, in which which particle filtering and particle MCMC methods realize, uh, is one of being able to quickly formulate and frequently reground dynamic models regrounding them as new evidence comes in uh, in the new reality not just estimating parameters but updating our understanding of the current situation so we can anticipate forward the model state is kept current excuse me with the latest evidence um, and we can use it then to project forward and study intervention trade-offs as well as to understand the current situation and it turns out that we'll be able to, by combining the model with incoming data, illuminate even latent areas of the system that aren't explicitly, explicitly measured. Our goal here is to avoid open loop models, models that once built are blinded to new evidence as it comes in, rather to be able to remove that blindfold so that we can navigate with, with greater confidence going forward in a way that welcomes new evidence. It's a bit like weather reports. When we're predicting the weather, we don't just rely on a weather report made at a certain time and simply run that forward, for example, to, to secure each successive day a weather report. We're not operating off a weather report created last week where each successive day is just plays out further into the future. Rather, the climate, the meteorological models that, that uh, are used uh, are updated to reflect what's actually taken, taken place um, and take that into account when projecting forward. So even if the weather report a week ago thought that today would be sunny and instead there's snow and anticipating what's coming tomorrow, we take today's weather as a given and, and project forward. So we're going to be bringing similar techniques, although in a probabilistic context, um, to dynamic models for mathematical epidemiology here. Okay, uh, so uh, particle filtering on uh, particle MCMC are, are powerful techniques that we've applied in well over uh, a dozen models now, perhaps approaching two dozen for a wide variety of conditions, many of them listed here, um, many of them uh, for uh, infectious diseases, and a great number of them now uh, published or, or under review. And our particular interest in this relates to my talk tomorrow, which will depict a, a broader context um, in which uh, we're informing models um, using streaming data coming from a variety of sources, including uh, uh, social media such as Twitter, uh, Yelp, um, 
uh, as well as uh, search queries uh, online from certain geographical areas of, of interest, uh, as well as uh, reports from um, sentinel populations carrying smartphones. And this data is streamed in, transformed from, from text into time series, etc., and fed in in an incremental fashion and recursive fashion into dynamic models equipped with particle filtering and particle MCMC to provide these models with an always updated estimate of what likely lies forward. Three key techniques that we use in this area are Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques, particle filtering, and particle MCMC, which combines the previous two. Now these techniques uh, are each extremely useful in this uh, age of, of uh, big data and high velocity data. These high velocity fire hoses to which we increasingly enjoy recourse in our modeling in, within the health sphere. But I'd like to distinguish those. MCMC um, is a technique we've uh, we've explicated in other other. Uh, pages uh, associated with dynamic modeling for health, um, but fundamentally it allows us to sample from the posterior distribution of, of static parameters for deterministic dynamic models. Um, and uh, that supports um, our ability to estimate the latent states of those models, um, uh, scenario results, and scenario gains uh, relative to, say, some baseline. By contrast, particle filtering is a technique that focuses not on deterministic models like MCMC, but on stochastic models. Um, it doesn't really make much sense to apply particle filtering without stochastics, for reasons that will be seen. And this, in particularly here, what we're sampling from is, is not model static parameter values but rather from model latent states, the latent state of the model as it evolves over time. In light of the stochastic evolution, we, we estimate and try to pin down an understanding of, of the latent state of the system. Uh, that by extension allows us to, uh, to evaluate uh, by projecting forward uh, the likely consequence of future scenarios our future evolution of the system, and allows us to evaluate interventions to, to assess scenario gains. Particle MCMC combines the previous two techniques in a very powerful way that supports uh, estimation from, via sampling, of both the posterior of static parameters as well as model latent states in light of stochastics. We're going to be talking about particle filtering, but much of what we're talking about fits hand in glove with particle MCMC. Okay, a few key facts about particle filtering. It's a bit of a spiral approach where we're, we're zeroing in on more substance, but coming around um, to emphasize uh, the basics uh, again and again. Okay, so. Particle filtering, um, uh, when applied to dynamic models, um, is applied to stochastic models incorporating stochastic factors. And the way in which it operates is um, fundamentally we run a simulation model uh, on a lot of particles simultaneously. And these particles are, are, are weighted quantities um, that conceptually represent draws from important sampled uh, samples. And between observation points, we simply run them forward. At observation points, this model goes through a correction process where those particles that are consistent with the new observation um, have their weights enhanced and are more likely to survive than those, that are, are those that, that are inconsistent with the evidence that fly in the face of this observation set of observations, this observation factor, um, will be downweighted. This technique is performed recursively. Um, uh, so when a new data a vector, new observation vector comes in, we uh, incorporate the understanding from that observation vector and update earlier, um, earlier estimates. However, we do not reprocess all the observations to this point. In contrast 
to the situation, for example, with uh, MCMC. Particle filtering, a contraposition to common filtering, um, relies on only very loose distributional assumptions, in contrast to the strong Gaussian assumptions relied upon heavily within the common filtering for optimality. Uh, in addition, um, while common filtering assumes the capacity to linearize a model, particle filtering is, is free of, of that requirement. There's really no reliance on the functional form or linearization. And particle filtering operates by, by sampling from, rather than constructing an MLE estimate like common filtering, it samples from the state um, and in, indeed uh, a trajectory distribution, where these are states and trajectories associated with the full state of the system, including the, the latent states. So over time, we're sampling from the states to, to get an understanding of the distribution, of the joint distribution over model states at a given time or in trajectories. Now, each sample is represented by a, a particle. It's termed a particle, um, each important sample. And uh, these particles reflect, as it were, a competing hypothesis as to what's going on within the model at a given time. As it were, competing hypothesis for the current state of the system. And there's a survival of the fittest of particles um, where that fitness is determined by consistency with observed data. So we're weeding out hypotheses that are inconsistent with the data and we're emphasizing reproducing uh, hypotheses that are consistent with the data. And this whole process is based on use of, of, of particles um, with these weights is based on the theory of importance sample. Okay, so how does particle filtering work in a nutshell? Well, from an implementation standpoint, it's, it's uh, recommended by the virtue of simplicity of implementation. We take an ODE model, we're going to focus our discussion here on, on ODE models, and we subscript it. And we subscript it by particle, and this would typically require hundreds to thousands of particles. We commonly use such models with 10,000 particles. Now it's critical to realize, ladies and gentlemen, that each particle here has its own entire copy of model state. Each particle has a hypothesis as to the current situation at this point in time, which includes a representation of all the states of the model. And the ODE model here must be a stochastic model. It must be a model that, that incorporates a significant stochastic components. Now, uh, in order to start off with, um, in order to start off with uh, the particle filtering, uh, we're going to sample uh, an initial state from the prior distribution associated with the uh, the, the model state. So we're going to specify the the modeler needs to specify a prior distribution, and we're going to sample the initial values of particles initial hypotheses for the starting state from that distribution. Now all of those particles are going to have their weights set uniformly to 1. And now we're going to run forward. And this process is going to alternate in two phases. In the prediction phase, between observations, um, we're going to allow for all particles to evolve according to the standard dynamics associated with the model. So we simply run the model forward on the particles. Next, uh, within this context, I should note that all particle weights remain invariant, and we're running the particles forward until the next observation. Now, by contrast, in an update phase, at the next observation point, 
um, for each particle, we're going to update the weight of the particle in a way that rewards particles uh, that hypothesize model state more consistent with the evidence and, and um, punish, as it were, or, or uh, de-emphasize particles, uh, the value of particles, which are inconsistent with that evidence, that fly in, whose hypothesis as to the current situation flies in the face of that evidence. And we do so by multiplying the particle weight by the likelihood of observing the empirical data, this, this empirical um, vector of observations. Okay? Um, and, and that is, of course, something that likelihood will reflect the state of that particular particle. Now, when the uh, effective sample size uh, associated with, with particles uh, is too low, in other words, there's too much disparities in weight, we're, we're, we've got too many low-weighted particles, uh, we're, we're using too much of our, of our um, particle space for, for these um, less, uh, less emphasized particles, we're going to perform resampling. And this is where there's the survival of the fittest. Particles with high weights are more likely to reproduce, and those with low weights are likely to disappear. And trajectories here, um, um, I should note, can be sampled by maintaining uh, an ancestry matrix uh, as to um, each occurrence of resampling. We essentially keep track um, whence a particle came uh, from resampling at each occurrence of resampling. So, so let's take a, a look at, at how this plays out um, for a case of, of measles. So in the case of measles, we'll have some, some uh, empirical datum um, uh, related to incident cases of measles. We'll have a compartmental model uh, associated with um, flows, deaths, and births. And as particle filtering runs, new data will come in. We've shown here the current time point with this red line. Um, this model is one that's incorporated um, and had uh, shaping um, its particle distribution according to a survival of the fittest. All this data pr to the left of this, uh, the time marked by this, by this red dotted line. And going forward, it's going to be predicting the state, uh, the, the number of, of incident cases uh, going forward. So the incident cases previously, as new data came in, model estimates as to the, to the, to the underlying state of the model were updated. So as new data points came in, say here at time 200, um, it shaped the model's uh, understanding of how many children were likely to be susceptible at that point, how many children are likely to be exposed, infected, recovered. And you'll notice that what we see before us is, is not a single point estimate at that time, it's a reflective of a distribution. And that distribution reflects a joint distribution over the different um, state variables uh, at that point in time. For the distribution associated with these different uh, different states. As new data points comes in, uh, it takes a, a model estimate uh, generated uh, by the model and combines in a new observation and favors those hypotheses which are more consistent with the observation. So essentially we're running the model over a distribution of different hypotheses about the current situation those hypotheses are evolving according to model dynamics, including stochastics. And when new data points comes in, we ground that. It tends to collapse down the distribution to a narrower distribution that reflects that data, and we continue on. At some point, we may wish to project forward from the current situation. So given our the distribution of possibilities at the current time across these latent states, we can project forward and, and anticipate what likely lies down the road given 
our current hypotheses, distribution of hypotheses as to the current situation. What is the likely evolution of the latent state? And by extension, what's the likely uh, number of cases that we'll be seeing? Now, that projection forward will typically be quite different depending on the current latent state. In this case, for example, we've captured it in the midst of uh, an outbreak and it's predicting a, a decreasing number of cases going forward here. Here we're anticipating, it's anticipating a coming outbreak and we're anticipating a rise in the number of cases. Okay, now that provides a very high level glimpse of, of particle filter. I'd like to now dig into more of the substance. To do so, I'm going to need to introduce some mathematical notation. Suppose, ladies and gentlemen, that we have here a state space model uh, with uh, capital N state variables. So we can consider a vector of, of size of length N associated with the underlying state of the model depicted by X. And that is governed by a set of state equations, which we'll assume to be a ordinary differential, a system of ordinary differential equations where we have noise associated with the evolution of that system. And as is familiar to um, those from mathematical background in the room, um, to update to update from um, from time k minus one to time k, we can integrate that that um, equation forward from time k minus one to now. Um, so this will be the the update step from time k minus 1 to time k. Now, we're going to make two assumptions here, OK? Um, number one, measurements are made at regular intervals, at unit intervals. And these, um, uh, and, and, and we'll denote those with k. That will indicate the, the observation interval. Now, beyond this, um, this equation, we're going to here reason about the not just the evolution of the system according to a uh, to a set of governing equations G but we're going to also reason about an observation model as is common in say control theory so here the observation model is going to take the underlying state of the system which is uh, includes a vector of length n and uh, given that state, we produce an observation um, of length m, a vector of length m, where this observation reflects that underlying state, but with some noise, uh, n sub k, whose um, influence may differ over time, hence the subscript k. Now the goal of our sampling here is to estimate at each time k, this state x sub k, um, uh, based on all the observed data till that point. And often we go beyond this and, by extension, uh, wish to sample from trajectories, um, trajectories of state, particular story of how things evolve from time 1 to time k based on this observed data, um, this data, uh, this observed data. Now you may wonder why we're seeking to estimate or this this state. Well, remember, this is a stochastic system. And if we want to predict forward, it behooves us to estimate the current situation so that instead of just shrugging our shoulders and being unsure as to how the system has evolved, we know what the current situation is so we can project forward, just like that weather report. We want to know it's snowing outside right now to anticipate what's likely to occur tomorrow. Now, the presence of these stochastics um, uh, prevents us from naively simply 
uh, applying, for example, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling to this. We have this uh, very high velocity um, stochastics going on, and it turns out it's trying to sample from that um, using MCMC, where we have stochastics occurring every every dt, as it were, is a full set around. Um, we, we can't sample from, from that dense of space. To make this feasible, um, we're going to be drawing on recursive waves of sampling that incrementally updates our, our samples from time k minus 1 to time k um, when we observe a new observation at time k. And we're going to go through that process in two stages, a prediction stage and an update stage. And it turns out that two stages, both in terms of the mathematical description of what we're sampling from, and then when it comes to uh, the limited time we have to cover how we're sampling from it, to understand why these particles are can be used to sample from it in this way, there'll also be a prediction and an update step. Now in the prediction step, um, we have a very familiar situation that should be familiar to all mathematicians here. So we have some state at time k minus 1, and we're going to, to map it to the situation at time k. Essentially, we run the model forward and numerically integrate it from time k minus 1 up to time k. Essentially, conceptually, to time k, but just prior to the observation that occurs at time k. So it's not considering the observation. We're simply integrating it up. And at time, uh, at the update step, by contrast, we're going to update from time k minus 1 to time k. Now, the net effect of this is to go from a probability distribution for the state at time k minus 1, giving all the evidence available till then, say a day ago, um, to a situation where we have an estimate for current situation, a probability distribution of a current state conditional on all the data we've observed till now. Okay, let's talk about how this, this occurs. So I'm going to have to go through this very quickly given the limited time, but the basic idea is suppose we, we have some distribution at time k minus 1 conditional on the data there. It turns out that if we crunch through the mathematics and I've provided a, a set of it, um, a set of slides which uh, can be used for this purpose. We can arrive at a formula for the probability distribution at time k, taking account all the data except the latest one. Remember, it's the update step, step that's going to take into account the observation at, at time k itself. But we can start from this initial distribution at time k minus 1 that took into account all the data till and including that time and we can map and given that distribution we can arrive at a formula for the probability distribution at, at time k taking into account all the data except this this latest point okay so so it turns out we're going to be able to capture this but this is this is the, the distribution available at the previous time, and this is reflecting the, the integration step from that previous time till now. Okay. Now, it's at the observations that the action happens, ladies and gentlemen. And it's at this time that uh, the model estimates of state are corrected by encounter, are corrected by empirical data. Essentially, and conceptually, there's a mapping from a prior to a posterior. Um, the prior is the estimate of state just before considering the latest data, and the posterior is the estimate of model state after considering. And a key role here will be the likelihood function, which expresses for a given model state the likelihood that we will observe a given empirical observation vector both at, at time t. And this is the job of the update step. So let's talk about this. We've, we've, we've got this sample, we've got this um, distribution for 
the state at time k, given all the data available up to, but not including that latest one. And the update step is going to take this latest observation vector and update it to um, a probability distribution for, for x sub k. Okay, so how are we going to uh, perform that? Well, we're going to uh, start with this and Well, it's a very involved process, one that you could read about in the slides in the later part of this, uh, the later part of the slide deck. We can take into account uh, within this context that the probability distribution for X sub A, given all the data up to and including that point, can be described as multiplication of the probability distribution for x sub t, given all the data not up to but not including this, times this likelihood function. Okay, um, This allows us to easily sample, to readily sample from this using, using important sampling, as we'll see. So um, if we uh, decompose it like that, we can recognize this is what we had already a probability distribution um, after the, the prediction step and uh, to get this probability distribution we can simply multiply that by by the probability by the likelihood function given the current state of the model now it turns out that this process can be used by extension to sample from the full trajectory of the system. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but fundamentally um, the mathematics is directly comparable and we can use it to to perform uh, these the sampling not just on, on each state at each time independently, but rather on, on trajectories stories as to how the system evolved in particular concrete ways over time. Okay, I'm now going to, so I've just characterized on the distributions from which we're going to, to sample here. I'd like to now provide a few minutes at least to describe how we sample from them. So we indicated the target distribution which we wanted to sample, but how do we actually draw values from it? Okay. Um, well, it turns out we make central use of, of this technique called um, important sampling, and particularly sequential important sampling. And we're going to, like, like in all important sampling, we're going to use a proposal distribution, and uh, we're going to have weighted samples from the proposal distribution, which we can use to then sample from the so-called target distribution. So the idea is with important sampling, suppose we want to, we have some distribution that we'd like to solve, to, to draw from. Well, sorry. Um, we'd like to be able to draw from, from this distribution for trajectories or at a simpler level for this distribution. Given all the data available to now, I'd like to be able to draw values from this distribution um, so that we can understand what that distribution looks like. Well, it turns out that if we want to draw values from an arbitrary distribution, in general it's it's hard to just do that. Um, instead, we uh, will often turn to a proposal distribution, which we can sample from more easily, like a uniform distribution or a normal distribution. We sample from that in a clever way that allows us to then, by extension, sample from um, our target distribution. And the, the way in which we do this is we create a set of sample values from, from this this um, proposal distribution. And when we, we draw these, we give more weight to, we assign weights to them that indicate that 
the ones that that are more plausible given the target distribution are upweighted, meaning that we consider them more, um, give them more emphasis. And those that are, so those that are overrepresented in Q of X, uh, the, the proposal distribution relative to the target distribution, will tend to be downweighted. Um, uh, this will tend to be smaller, they'll be given smaller rates. By contrast, if we draw a value from Q of X, whose probability is much more likely in P of X compared to how it's like how, how likely it is to occur in Q of X, we give it a stronger value, reflecting the fact that it's 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 more heavily uh, more heavily represented in, in P of X. So we keep these weights around and they're normalized, but but the basic deal is they reflect the um, the the relative importance of a given of a given sample. And then, having done this process, we'll draw from these so-called important samples that are weighted um, with the likelihood of drawing each one proportional to their weight. Okay, So um, we go through a second phase of sampling. The first phase of sampling was from the proposal distribution. The second phase, we'll draw these, these weighted samples with the probability of getting each one according to their weight. So those that are that would occur in P of X more than they did with Q of X will have these higher weights and we'll be more likely to get them at this step. Those that are less that we got from Q of X but are would have been vanishingly unlikely to have P of X would have very low weights and we'll be very unlikely to get those in, in this step. So it turns out that these important samples that we draw with the weights are called particles, okay? And um, at any one time, a, a, a particle represents a sample from the state of the model at that time that's weighted, this important sample. And each particle is associated with a copy of model state and a normalized weight, okay? Um, and there's a survival of the fittest going on. The particles that have higher weights are more likely to survive and reproduce. Those that have lower weights are, by contrast, um, more likely to die out. Die out, And there's a, typically a fixed number of particles retained, okay? So if we had a model, for example, with, with these states in it, uh, each particle would have some particular posit, some particular value for each of these. At a given point of time, it hypothesizes a certain number of susceptibles, a certain number of exposed, a certain number of infected, certain number of vaccinated at a given time. We could think of this as extended in the Z dimension. And the particle is, is expressing um, each particle being associated with a, a state factor. Now, um, each particle has its own full copy of the model state. Um, so it has its own full hypothesis of the current situation in the model. In between observations, the particles just evolve according to the standard stochastic model dynamics. The particle weights remain invariant, and there's no filtering out of these particles. At an observation point, the particle weights are updated to reflect the likelihood of observing the empirical data. Particularly, their weights are just multiplied by that likelihood. And if there's too much disparity of weights, we, we resample particles. Okay, so the the overall process is, is indicated like this, as you see with, with particle filtering. We sample from some from some uh, proposal distribution here, and we we update the weights according to a process um, at, for each observation, including in a way that takes into account here the, uh, the observation um, in light of the likelihood of the observation in light of the, of the current state. Okay. Now, I'd like to, this should be a Q, I believe there, yeah. Um, okay, and, and then, uh, Within this, uh, within the prediction form, as I noted, the weights remain unchanged. We simply run the particles forward, uh, and uh, 
we have a, a target distribution here. Um, the weight that we're going to set is, is given by this. Um, and it turns out that by, uh, by clever choice of our proposal distribution, uh, we can simply set it so the proposal distribution for trajectories from time one to day that incorporate this is the same as the proposal distribution from earlier times uh, a certain proposal distribution that depends on that previous state and, and uh, the set of all observations by co conveniently cho choosing that we'll be able to secure great economies uh, particularly in the update phase in the update phase we're going to have uh, we're going to be uh, seeking to, to compute a be able to draw samples from this uh, probability distribution over the current state, given all data to this certain point. And we're going to do so via updating the weights. Now, this is where that choice of proposal distribution uh, came out. Um, we're going to update uh, this weight according to this context where here is the likelihood function and we have this this ratio here and uh, by a clever choice of the proposal distribution um, used in this form we can obtain a great simplification by which we can when we have a new observation we can simply assess the likelihood, a new observation, for a given particle to update the weights for that particle, particle i. We can simply take the state of that particle i, which is of dimension n here, and we can consider the likelihood of observing this new likelihood vector in light of this state. That likelihood or return of value. To update the weight according of that particle i according to this new observation. Simply multiply that likelihood times the old weight to get the new weight. So a central choice here reflects the choice of this likelihood function and the most, uh, we've explored a wide variety of them negative binomial, Pascal distribution, normal binomial. Uh, these are all highly uh, uh, highly valuable for different types of models. And there's a fair bit of science and art in choosing these uh, appropriately and choosing the parameters for them. What's notable here is that when each new data point comes in, we can simply update the weight considering all previous data by the weight considering the new data to get the new weight. This is a recursive process. It doesn't require us to reconsider all the data to this current point. Rather, it updates these weights that considered all the previous data with the weight for this data. As a result, particle filter is exceptionally well suited for streaming solutions where, where we handle each new data observation factor as it arrives. Now there's a further resampling step when there's too large a diversity of particle weights, when we're putting too many, I think too many particles devoted to, to low, low weight particles, particles that are extremely unlikely, we perform a, a resampling of the particle. As a result, um, uh, particles that have higher weights are more likely to be multiplied. Particles that have lower weights are more likely uh, to, uh, uh, to disappear. So a given particle in the resampling phase uh, with a high weight is more likely to be multiplied. They have many children. Particles with low weights are unlikely to be multiplied. So the particle weight 
uh, is used to dictate whether it survives or not according to the survival of the fittest. And of course, the weight is determined in turn by the degree to which a given particle state accords with the observation. So this uh, survival of the fittest where fitness is determined by the degree to which a particle accords with observations. If we want to compute statistics over amount of quantities, we want to take, for example, the mean, we want to take determine credibility intervals, we want to uh, take standard deviations, we want to compute proportions. Um, we do so over samples from particles. These are important samples, and we draw from them with a, with a likelihood according to weights. Okay, just a few additional comments here. So, when it comes to, to model description, a key point of tuning with the model has to do to what degree our model incorporates stochastics. Stochastics are used um, uh, to characterize uh, two, two things. Sometimes they characterize stochastic processes in the world. Uh, another time, they're, they're used to give our model a degree of humility, to allow it to be more open to suggestion or, or um, being nudged by the empirical data towards certain interpretation of the current situation. And here, we're trying to achieve a balance between uh, avoiding avoiding overconfidence in the model uh, on the one hand and uh, on the other hand uh, achieving a degree of, of model self a sense of self-efficacy as it were. So we don't want a model that bullheadedly ignores all observations and, and simply marches particles forward to its own governing equations ignoring observations will fail to take into account um, to the degree necessary observed data. At the same time, we don't want a model that is it's so uncertain about what's likely to play out in terms of stochastics that it becomes quickly, hopelessly uncertain and projecting forward from the current situation. And there's multiple means of introducing stochastics that, that I won't talk about. I want to offer a few comments on particle filtering with ABMs, which has formed a substantial part of our, of our work. We do more work with ABMs uh, than with, um, uh, than with uh, differential equation models, system dynamics models. Uh, with HM-based models, we have a great deal of, of extra strength that can come in through representation of things such as network structure, geographic context, representing the hist capturing the history of agents and history dependence of, of phenomenon, ways in which we can, we can uh, richly capture situated decision making among agents, etc. ABMs are extraordinarily powerful. Um, and it's very natural to ask the degree to which uh, particle filtering, and by extension particle MCMC, can be used effectively with ABMs. Guidelines for effectively using particle filtering with the ABMs have, have yet to be elucidated, uh, unfortunately. Um, given the, the high dimensionality of state space for ABMs, uh, even likely considered from standpoint of intrinsic dimensionality, um, non-sparsely covering the state space and with, with particles requires a very high number of particles. And partly because of the size of the ensemble, and partly because of the high demand associated with, with uh, uh, the need to represent and to simulate a, a complete um, agent-based model, we have high computational resource demands, both space and time. Um, this is an area of active work for us. Um, we we are very interested in advancing particle filtering with the ABMs, and we see key 
needs here in terms of leveraging uh, parallel computing technologies in the form of GPUs and, and field programmable gate arrays um, and in distributed computation such as we've used uh, elsewhere. Okay, a few points of note. So particle filtering continually regrounds uh, model state given evidence from, from data. With estimated current state, particle filter models can probabilistically project forward and, and they can be used for intervention evaluation. It's often more effective than calibration because of regrounding of light state and, and uh, the choice of likelihood function is very important. It can take many lines of evidence and give a portrait of the underlying situation and how it evolves. Particle filtering needs to balance, um, on the one hand, too little confidence uh, and too much confidence. We need model stochastics to effectively uh, capture that and, and tune appropriately. In tuning the, like, the parameters of likelihood functions, such as dispersion parameters and stochastics, makes a big difference. Because of the lack of strict distributional assumptions in the model form, particle filtering is really highly versatile. It's very well suited for work with many public health streams and stochastic models. In the presence of aggregate dynamic models, particle filtering can perform well. The application of particle filtering, however, is not a turn the crank process and does involve iteration and learning, tuning the model. And uh, research progress is required to improve software support for feasibility associated with dynamic uh, um, application of ABM, um, so agent based models, and discrete event simulation with particle filtering. Thank you very much. I'd like to just note um, uh, one of our coming events. Uh, combining data science and system science directly relevant um, to this event, and uh, two other events which may be of interest uh, to participants. Um, I would note that I provided a, a much more extensive set of derivations for anyone who might be interested. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to have you uh, with, with me today, and I hope this information has provided some value.